presentation is open data practices in proteomics, the why, the how, and the, and the, and the what for. So first of all, I thought that it was good to include a couple of slides to give some background about uh, where we are based. So we uh, are working in the European Bioinformatics Institute, MBLEBI, which is based in uh, the south of Cambridge. And it's really the world leading source of public biomolecular data. Uh, really our vision is to benefit uh, humankind by advancing scientific discovery and impact through bioinformatics. And I'm sure that most of you must have used uh, at least one or if not many of the resources that are provided by uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. And there are many, I don't know, from, from Ensemble and like Uniprot, um, Protein Data Bank, and uh, the EBA and the EGA and so many resources that I'm sure you have must have used. My, my thing is responsible for, for Pride, the Pride Data is like you will be uh, listening uh, to me later. Okay, so after this uh, very short preamble, I'm gonna give an overview of the talk. First, I'm gonna talk about the why, why sharing proteomics data is a good thing. Then the how, and I will talk about protein exchange resources and the Pride database in particular, but I will also talk about other protein exchange resources. And the what for, and the what for I think maybe is the most important thing in, in the talk, is just to show you some examples of data reuse of pebble data sets to see what can be done with that data. And I will end just with one, a summary slide about future perspectives or important things for the future, okay? So I hope that, uh, as I said, you, you will find this interesting. So uh, about the why, so this is the first uh, question that I would like to answer in my in my talk. So why it is important to share proteomics data in the public domain? So uh, as we all know, if we are working in the field, proteomics data can be very complex and in its interpretation is often difficult and in some cases controversial. In other omics fields that are considered more mature, like genomics and transcriptomics, data sharing culture was very well established, especially since the Human Genome Project, uh, that uh, you know, the first uh, version of the Human Genome uh, was uh, produced more than 20 years ago now. It is uh, considered to be a good scientific practice, of course. Uh, we are uh, lucky in the field because really, uh, we are uh, really now, I think, uh, in parallel to uh, these other fields like dynamics and transcriptomics because the data sharing culture has really definitely consolidated in, in, in recent years. And this has been really a big, big change and a change for the better. Uh, scientific journals and funding agencies are two of the main drivers in this direction. But of course, I think that everyone uh, in the field realizes that open science practices are more and more important. And therefore, they have become more popular. So what is a proteomics publication in this year, in 2023? So as we all know, proteomics studies, like in any other kind of high throughput omics technique, generate potentially large amounts of data and results. So ideally, a proteomics publication needs to, first of all, summarize the results of the study. And second, provide supporting information for uh, at least checking the reliability of any results that are reported. So therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you are well aware of this. The information included in a publication these days is included in the manuscript. This is what most people read. Then the supplementary material. This is basically what, uh, you know, people that have a higher interest in some particular aspect of the work, maybe technical, then, uh, you know, uh, people read that part as well, of course. And then what is becoming again, uh, Unvaluable and also important is to have the associated data submitted to a public repository so that everyone can access this data. And again, this has been triggered by uh, scientific journals and funding agencies. So there are many journals that nowadays recommend and mandate, in most cases, submission to proteomics repositories. These are mainly the journals of the Nature Group. They have been really pioneers in this context. Uh, Proteomics journals like MC of Proteomics, but also other journals like uh, the PLOS journals or eLife and many others. And also what has happened also more, more and more in recent times is that the funding agencies have, are enforcing more and more public deposition of data to maximize the value of the funds provided. That means, of course, that the, the value of the funds doesn't stop at the end of the grant. It means that other people in the future can use the same data, can reuse the same data, for uh, for uh, getting new uh, scientific knowledge. Also, proteomics repositories are very important for supporting reproducible research, reproducible research and reproducible science. So, of course, we should aim that uh, 
you know, what we are reporting in a, in a manuscript, in a paper, is as reproducible as possible. Okay, so I have, uh, hopefully I convinced you why uh, sharing proteomics data is a good thing and it is important. Uh, the second uh, point in my talk is just to explain you how. Um, for that, how you can do it. So for that, I'm going to explain about proton exchange resources and the Pride database in particular. Also, uh, although I will be talking about other uh, other proton exchange resources as well. So first of all, I need to really define what proton exchange is. So we started this more than ten years ago, and the idea at the time, and I think it has been achieved is that uh, uh, the different or the main proteomic resources in the field international should be able to implement a standard data submission and data dissemination practices between them, okay? Then they could do things maybe a slightly different or something slightly different, but of course, at least there would be a, a minimum common denominator. And I think that uh, we are lucky in the field because we have been um, able to do this. Uh, we shouldn't take this for granted because in other fields, this has really uh, has not happened, at least has, has not happened so far. So that means that uh, in the field, we have been uh, you know, clever enough to do this together in a collaborative manner. So Protein Exchange started uh, again more than 10 years ago with Pride here in, in the UK, um, Peter Dallas, led by our, our colleague Eric Deutsch in the Institute of Persistent Biology. But since then, four resources more joined, Massive and um, Panorama in the US, and then two resources also in Asia, IPROX in China, I will talk about it uh, a bit more in detail uh, later, and also JPOX in, in Japan. So thanks to the reliability of protein exchange, and again to the development of open science practices in the field, really uh, the journals and founders are also uh, are now uh, mandating data deposition, and really as a result, data sharing has generalized in the proteomics field. So which are the which are the main types of information that are stored in proteomics repositories? So, I mean, the short answer to this is that basically everything that is relevant for, for reporting uh, an experiment. What is really mandatory to include in every submission is the original experimental MS data recorded by the mass spectrometer, the primary data, usually the, the raw data for sure, and in some cases, the, the thick list. Then we have the process results, that uh, they include identification, but also quantification. Then what is really important, of course, is include as many or as much experimental and technical metadata as possible, because of course, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, data types are not very valuable with, uh, without the proper uh, experimental or technical background. And then any other type of relevant information is also always welcome. For example, the search database or spectral libraries, or maybe potential scripts that uh, that were used. This is also important in the field because also the field needs to really develop in parallel to what is happening in other fields. So I don't know if you have heard the term; uh, it's very trendy. A uh, fair, <laughs> fair data, the fair data uh, principles. And um, this is really a, a, a big development in biology. And uh, the, the acronym FAIR means that uh, the data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I'm not going to explain what all this means. I just wanted to say that uh, if you have heard FAIR, and, uh, and, and at least I wanted you to, uh, to know what this means, I'm going to be mentioning of course, at the end, uh, a big part of my talk is going to be uh, devoted to the reusable part. But uh, I just wanted to highlight that the development of uh, open science practices and proteomics repositories are really important in the context of fair data in proteomics. OK, so as I mentioned before, uh, my team is responsible for uh, PRIDE. PRIDE is the uh, proteomics identification database and is based at the EBI. It was started by my colleague, uh, Leonard Martens, in 2004, 2005. And so it's now uh, almost 20 years, <laughs> 20 years old. And the next year, it will be 20 years old. Uh, so it's a lot of time. Uh, and really, Pride is the EBI resource that stores mass spectrometry-based proteomics data sets, including, as I mentioned before, the mass spectra, uh, but also spectra and protein expression information, the results I need kind of uh, related information. All mass spec proteins are supported and, and, and really the, the amount of data in the public domain now is huge. By May 2023, there are more than 33 and a half thousand data sets in Pride. 
Um, and this next slide is also to show you, uh, you know, how this data has been growing over the years. This is an histogram that shows the number of submitted data sets to Pride since 2010 to 2022. And this really shows the huge, this is not cumulative, this is year per year. So this is just to make you realize about how uh, data sharing in the public domain has really uh, grown dramatically in the last in the last few years. And it's still growing. It seems that uh, in the last few years is is uh, growing uh, less rapidly in a way, and uh, and 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 it's very nice that this happened, of course. An average of 514 submitted datasets were submitted per month during uh, 2022, and this uh, comprises around 83 percent of all protein exchange datasets. That's why Pride is really the, the the world leading resource in in this context. And of course, this is things. This is, uh, no one knows this outside the team. So, of course, Dipti knows very well all the work that is behind all this every single day. And uh, because, of course, uh, things need to work seamlessly for the external users. But really, uh, this growth has been possible due to huge improvements in private infrastructure, including scalability, reliability, and automation. So, um, it's also important, I think, to give uh, an overview about which are the main organisms that are uh, represented. So there is no surprise for you, I'm pretty sure, but the most represented organism is uh, human, Homo sapiens, that uh, comprises around 44% of the data sets, but it also includes cell lines. So yes, it's, it's important to include that. And, and then, of course, the main uh, model organisms are just behind. Mouse, Saccharomyces, Arabidopsis, rat, E. coli, uh, Bostaurus, Drosophila, uh, pig, C. elegans. So there's really no surprise here. But what is really important to highlight that is that more than 3,600 uh, taxonomy IDs are represented. So it's really, if you are working in a, in a particular organism, even if it's not really uh, very widely studied, uh, it is. It would be strange that there is not uh, protomist data available in the in the public domain for it, for for this organism. So the the workflow to submit data to Pride is uh, or to any other protein exchange resource is that uh, of course the data needs to be organized first, and that requires some work. And of course there is always some learning curve. But I would say that over the years the process has become more and more easy and straightforward. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been this kind of uh, huge growth in, in the number of data sets in the public domain. So, um, the, so the scientists submit the data using the PX submission tool that I will explain in the next slide. And for that, again, we need the raw data, the results, and also any other kind of data. Then uh, Pride uh, curators check and process the data. And before, they, there used to be a lot of manual component here. And now it's more and more automated. And curators only look at the data if it's really required. And then, of course, the data gets submitted to Pride. And a data set accession number is generated. So the submissions to Pride happen mainly using the what we call the uh, program exchange submission tool. They use a standalone tool that is developed in Java and that was developed uh, many years ago and is continuously improved. Um, it streamlines the submission process. Again, the mandatory components are the raw files and the process results and any other type of other files are optional. Uh, it captures the mappings between the files, it enables metadata notation, and then it enables the, the, the file transfer to, uh, through the internet, to the ABI which can happen using FTP, but also using Aspera, which is a technology that uh, allows, in general, for faster up upload speeds. So this is kind of where you can access some of the documentation. And there is a, a manuscript that we wrote many years ago that summarizes the process. Of course, the process has changed slightly, but really not that much in the last, in the last years. So then how to access this data? So this data can be accessed to the Pride web interface, a file FTP repository, or if you uh, want to uh, retrieve more data in a batch, you can do it using our application programming interface API, the, the REST web service. Uh, some slide that I wanted to include here because it's important because we usually get asked about this a lot, is that when does it happen, the, the public data release? So usually when uh, submitters uh, submit their data to 
subscribe, but then also to any other protein exchange resource, the data remains private. And it's always private by default. We provide a username and password, and that uh, can be used within the manuscript review process. So that can be provided to reviewers, that can be provided to journal editors, and the data is going to be, it's going to be, you know, it's always going to be private. But then uh, as soon as the, uh, as the, publication gets published, the corresponding publication gets published, then the, the data should be made publicly available as soon as possible. So uh, that means that uh, in many cases, uh, we will only find out if the submitter tells us that that's the case. Because, uh, you know, sometimes it's really not so easy to find out that uh, a paper uh, has been published uh, and that it contains a, a, a data set that is uh, reported in that paper. We can look for PhD identifiers in PubMed extracts and also in full tests for those articles that are open access, but those are, you know, uh, the minority. So really, if your PhD identifier is not in an abstract or, or, or your paper is not open access, uh, a paper, the paper may have been published, but the data will still be private because we will not be able to, to know that, uh, you know, that that's, that's the case. So please, let us know because that will help to um, to know to speed the process of, of making the, the data publicly available. So I have talked about Pride because, of course, it's the, it's the resource that I'm responsible for. But uh, I'm also going to talk about other protein exchange resources. I think this is really important and it's great that uh, such a network has been um, developed over or, you know over the years. And uh, since I know that there are many uh, Chinese students attending this uh, this webinar, I wanted to talk uh, especially a little bit about IPROX, which stands for the Integrated Proteomics Resource. This is the this is the URL. It's the Chinese Proteomics Resource, so it's, you could call it the, the Chinese Pride. Although uh, there are some things that are uh, similar, but uh, there are other things that are a, a little bit different. But again, the minimum common denominator is the same. The IPROX is focused on MSMS proteomics data. It's widely used by Chinese researchers, so I'm sure many in, in, in the webinar you are using regularly um, uh, IPROX because it's mainly used by, by, Chinese, uh, by Chinese researchers. And in the last video, it has, really, has greatly improved infrastructure, including the addition of our reanalysis spiral. So you can read all the details in, in these papers that are highlighted here. And in the last update that was published like one and a half years ago, here is highlighted the you know the improvements that have been uh, happening in IPROX. So IPROX has now also uh, a, a programmatic access, a, a API. It has new visualization uh, features. It has also a analysis pipeline and other features that other uh, protein repositories have, including you know others protein exchange resources. So it is really great that our colleagues in, in, in China and the people that are responsible for, for IPROX led by uh, Jupin Zhu are really keeping in parallel to the developments that, uh, that we are doing in all parts of the world. I would also like to highlight Massive, uh, which is the resource in the University of California, San Diego, is led by my colleague Nuno, Nuno Bandega. This is the, this is the URL. It's the largest protein exchange resource in the US. It also has kind of generalistic interest focus on MSMS data. It's important to highlight that it contains really lots of data, including many data sets that were originally submitted to other PX resources, for instance, to Pride. There are many Pride data sets that are replicated in Massive. Uh, they have some tools available for users to analyze your own data, which is really, uh, really nice. And they're also very actively reanalyzing data sets, uh, as I will be mentioning later again. And one of the points that also they have been working very actively in, in, in the last few years is in the creation of a spectral libraries, as I will also mention later. So if you don't want to go to every uh, uh, single protein exchange resource individually, there is, uh, uh, there is a, a website called Proton Central, which provides centralized access. It's a centralized portal for all public protein exchange data sets. So, uh, this portal is uh, managed from uh, from Seattle. This is the URL, and basically, what you can go there is basically to to look for datasets in all protein exchange resources. So you could look there for datasets in Pride, in JPOS, in IPROX, or in Massive. It needs to be public, of course, but uh, because 
the communication between the individual resources and proton cell plant doesn't happen till the till the corresponding um, uh, till the corresponding data set it has been made publicly available. So uh, again, let me highlight the concept of uh, proton as change um, that I think has really been successful. We keep to uh, collaborating together. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, time to uh, explain in detail uh, uh, JPOST. Uh, our uh, colleagues uh, from Japan do a uh, splendid work there. Also, I don't have time to talk today much in detail about Panorama Public, uh, but uh, it's just because there is, uh, there is a, a lack of time. Okay, so I hope that uh, in, in the last few minutes you learn about how to make the uh, the data publicly available uh, for everyone in the community using any of the protein exchange resources there. And uh, now I'm going to talk about the workflow. Maybe that's the most interesting part of my talk. I'm going to uh, explain in detail some examples of data reuse for public data sets. Because, of course, the whole purpose of, uh, you know, storing that much data in, in, in the public domain is that that data is reused and is actively reused by anyone in the community. So this is basically the, the whole concept. Uh, uh, people do an experiment. Maybe you, uh, you do an experiment in your lab. Then you do your own interpretation. You generate new knowledge, which gets uh, published maybe in a paper. And then this knowledge is disseminated into a, a database. And then you know this knowledge from the paper and from the database, maybe generate new ideas to do a new experiment, new interpretation. And this circle hopefully continues and continues without, uh, uh, without uh, stopping. But uh, now, because of all this data that is available in the public domain, it is possible to shorten this uh, circle a little bit. So for the information that is available in databases, like protein exchange resources of pride in particular, it is possible to perform what, the, what we call in silico proteomics experiments that, uh, that, of course, generate new interpretation, a new knowledge that they can, they can be published independently and then generate new ideas to perform new and uh, uh, new experiments and, of course, to perpetuate this bit of uh, circle of uh, of proteomics data reuse. So the take home message here, and I hope this is the most important thing that I would like you to take with you if, when you finish this, uh, this uh, webinar, is that it is not always needed to generate new data in, in the lab to get the conclusions that, or to, to do the studies that you need to, to perform. Is in, in fact, public data sets can be used in bioinformatics studies, and there are many options, and you will learn about some of them in the next few minutes but also as complementary data to generate the data in the lab. So it's important to highlight that it's not always required to, uh, to, generate, uh, to generate new data. It's in some cases, it's, uh, it's, more, uh, it's wiser to look to similar experiments in the public domain and to use that to, uh, to confirm or to, um, or no, or to uh, put them together with the data that you are generating. This is kind of the, the main message that I want to give. So in this part of the talk, as I mentioned before, I uh, want to highlight the reusable aspect of uh, public proteomics data. And again, this is really key in the context of FAIR and, and, and what it means, as I mentioned before. And, uh, and also, you want to keep yourself with an image of what I want to highlight here, is that really uh, the data in public proteomics repositories is like the cave of wonders. So I remember uh, many years ago when I, when I saw Aladdin and I... I, uh, I, I remember this very well. And uh, this is actually the case. Uh, depending on which, uh, what you want to do, uh, the public proteomics repositories can really be a case of wonders for you because maybe you have there the data that you need, or maybe you have data there to uh, text many of the ideas that you want to test. And uh, it's really, really a case, case of wonders. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to highlight some uh, high-level examples of public data reuse. The classification that I have made is kind of, you know, um, it, it could be made in other ways, but I think it, it will be useful to, uh, for you to highlight some of, the, some of the uses that this data has. And the first use that uh, maybe can be highlighted, and this is not in particular order, it's just an uh, artificial order that I have created, is the creation of spectral libraries. So uh, spectral libraries are collections of uh, experimental spectra that, uh, that, you know, that are accumulated and that uh, historically have been used for performing DDA experiments. So 
Um, many of the proteomic resources, Pride, Massive, also Petra Dallas, but also NIST, have provided uh, spectral libraries for, for many years. This is also common in, in metabolomics, mass spec metabolomics. But um, and for that, you know, the, the easiest way to do this is to, uh, to, to put together a lot of uh, data that has been uh, made available in the public domain to create these spectral libraries. Um, also, spectral libraries are increasingly more and more important because, of course, as you probably know, uh, they, uh, they can be used for, for DI analysis. And one of the ways to perform the DI analysis is to use uh, public spectral libraries for that. And, um, and this is why really there's a now a renaissance of the use of uh, spectral libraries in the field. In any case, if you generate your own DDA experimental library for a DA experiment, you should also share it in the public domain because it is important for reproducibility uh, purposes. The second example of uh, use of public data sets is benchmarking of software. And, and this is really very common. And you will know about this if you are a bioinformatician or a computer scientist, you are well aware of this because it's, it is quite common to do this. Basically, every time, uh, new software is published, then there is the need to perform a comparison with the previous tools, with the state of the art in the field. And um, this is done, of course, using mainly uh, public data sets. And, and, and this happens all the time. There are, you know, uh, dozens of papers published uh, describing new tools uh, every week. And in, in many cases, in most cases, they use public data sets for the benchmarking. So in, in most cases, the, uh, the raw data is used at the basis, but not always, because for instance, in the, in the in case of visualization tools or, 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 or other type of tools, in some cases, it is uh, it is possible to use the, the process the process results that were originally deposited. So there are lots and lots and lots of publications uh, that uh, make use of public data sets for benchmarking. And again, there are new tools every week. Uh, so this is just, you know, uh, a very small sample of all manuscripts that uh, that use uh, public data sets for for benchmarking. So um, the third kind of uh, uh, data type of data reuse that this is basically what I'm going to be uh, talking about in the in the rest of this section is data reanalysis. And data reanalysis, of course, it comprises to put together. Uh, groups of uh, raw files and to uh, reanalyze them in different uh, different ways for different purposes. And really many, many, many things can be done in the context of data reanalysis. The first thing that uh, I want to highlight is, for instance, to provide a consistent view of the proteome. So uh, this has been done for, for many, many years by my colleagues in Petra Atlas, led by Eric Deutsch or GPNDB, uh, led by uh, Ron Bibis, and what these resources have been doing in the context of identification data, they have been collecting raw data and they have been reprocessing it using a consistent data analysis pipeline and an up-to-date protein sequence database. The advantage of this is that they can provide a standardized and updated view on the experimental data that is available, so providing a view on a particular proteome, uh, of course, because uh, one common analysis method is used. Of course, the this has the inconvenience sometimes that the, the results can be different from the original author's view on the data. So the main resources that have been doing this for many years are GPNDB and Petra Dallas, but also Massive is doing it in the context of the HPP project. And uh, what is the HPP project? So the HPP project stands for the Human Protein Project, uh, uh, that, uh, the Human Protein Project that was studied by UPO in 2010 in Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. And it has been a tremendous effort to put together, uh, to coordinate different uh, groups of people coming from different countries, trying to, um, trying to detect all proteins in the, in the human, in the human protein. So it was the original objective of the project. And it has been now mostly achieved, I would say. If you see the last report of, uh, uh you know, the, uh, the HPP project, the report there, this paper is for the end of the, uh, last year. They uh, found evidence for more than, uh, so for almost 18 and a half thousand proteins. So approximately 93% of all the proteins in the, in the human protein. So, uh, Petra Atlas, but also Massive 
has been reanalyzing a lot of data uh, to, to provide this information to the HPP. But they have been mainly focused on identification. I think it's important to highlight that uh, there are other sources that they have been reanalyzing data with the view to provide a quantitative view on the uh, on the protein. And this has been done by uh, the team uh, led by uh, Matthias Wilhelm, uh, Proteomics DB in Munich. And uh, this is really a very nice resource. And of course, they use a lot of data that have been generated locally by the by the group, but they also integrate data sets from, from other origins there. And they provide a very uh, nice quantitative view on the human proteome. Another resource that maybe you have heard about, but the thing is, uh, they use a completely different method. I'm not going to get into the detail. Is PaxDB, the Proton Abundance Database. Uh, this is the URL, and the, uh, the version 5 has been recently uh, submitted to publication. It's in a preprint. And uh, you can also uh, acquire there a quantitative view on, on different proteins, not only not only human. And uh, our contribution to this uh, uh, work has been in the context of an EBI resource that is called Expression Atlas that historically has stored uh, gene expression information coming from human, but also from the main modern organisms. And we, this, uh, we, what we have tried to provide in just in in recent years is to uh, provide uh, information about uh, protein quantitative information there and integrate it to the gene expression information. So this has been our main objective. This is why we have been uh, curating and reanalyzing uh, data sets from Pride and integrating this information in the in special atlas. And we have done this for a number of studies, cell lines and tumor tissue, human, mouse and rat baseline studies. Uh, we have done also a pilot study with the cell lines and serum. And all this has been published uh, recently. Uh, so far, approximately 100 quantitative proteomics data sets are integrated in, in expression atlas. And this is really how it looks. But um, without talking about more about the detail, about the details about this, the most important concept here is that, you know, uh, groups of uh, raw files coming from different data sets can be reanalyzed together to provide either a qualitative or quantitative view on the protein. And this is what an increasing number of resources are, are doing. Uh, another uh, type of, of, of a study is what we could call meta-analysis study. Uh, again, what I've been providing so far is kind of a meta-analysis, but, uh, but uh, of course, there are different types of meta-analysis. Here, the idea is to put data coming from a lot of experiments together to extract new knowledge. So, for instance, data integration of experiments done in different labs at different time points. And, and, and for this uh, approach, uh, data is mainly reanalyzed because uh, that's considered to be the, the best way to make uh, the data more comparable. So again, there have been uh, lots of studies. Uh, I mean, what also what the proteomics uh, repositories are doing, it could be also considering a meta-analysis, but, uh, but I thought that, that these cells are their own category. But uh, there are many, many uh, studies that are performing this, are putting different data sets together with different objectives uh, and, and trying to extract new information by putting all that information together. So there are several papers, for instance, in the context of protein complexes and protein-protein interactions. There are also some papers in the context of, uh, of clustering of innocent spectra and, and, and many other. And this is uh, kind of something that has happened also in other fields. So there are, if you go to, you know, to uh, investigate what has been done in transcriptomics, there have been really a lot of studies, meta-analysis studies, where a lot of information coming from a, a, a big uh, number of transcriptomics studies have been put together. Okay, so another kind of subtype of uh, data reanalysis studies, again, different purposes, there are different ways to do this classification. It would be uh, in the context of artificial intelligence, machine learning, of deep learning approaches. As I'm sure you are aware, these approaches are more and more important in biology and in proteomics in particular. There is a very nice review paper uh, by the Matthias Manns group that was published uh, almost a couple of years ago. And if you haven't read it and you are interested in this topic, I would invite you to read it and because it contains this nice um, figure where it summarizes the different efforts that have been done in the field to improve the proteomics experimental workflow using uh, machine uh, learning approaches or artificial intelligence approaches. 
So uh, as you can see, this figure includes all the steps in the Proteomics um, uh, analytical workflow, going from uh, the sample, then it's the digestion, the liquid chromatography, the iron mobility, then there's one aspect, the spectra fragmentation, then there's two spectra, then the spectra and protein identification, and the protein quantification. And there have been many groups that have contributed with new tools to improve uh, these uh, different aspects in the proteomics of There has been really a revolution in, in this context, for instance, in the context of prediction of peptide uh, fermentation and re-scoring um, and many other steps. These are just some of the tools that are there. I would like to highlight that public data sets are very often reused as training sets. And also, um, and, and this is happening more and more, of course, because the more data, uh, the, the more reliable the predictions will become. There are uh, many papers that have been published in this context in, in recent years. And again, these are just a small subset. And what is clear, at least to me, is that these approaches are only going to become more and more important in, in the near future. And for that, it's also key that uh, uh, there is more and more data in the public domain. OK, and uh, just to finish uh, this, this part, I would like to highlight what I I call another type of data reanalysis, what I call a new analysis perspectives <laughs> or repurposing. That's another way to call it, where, uh, well, you know, the, the data is being analyzed with a different purpose to the, to the one that was intended in the original study. And there are two main examples of this. One is the proteinomics approaches, and one is also the new, uh, new PTMs. So, um, in the context of, uh, of proteinomics approaches, just a definition in proteinomics approaches, proteinomics data is combined with genomics and transcriptomics information, typically by using uh, sequence databases generated for DNA sequencing efforts, RNA-seq experiments, RAVOSEC approaches, uh, or non-known coding RNAs. So, um, so proteinomics has been historically used for genome, genome annotation purposes. And there have been a lot of uh, studies where uh, MS data proteins that has been reused for this purpose. So again, no new data was generated. The data was taken from public repositories, and there have been really uh, many publications what, what, uh, where this has been achieved. So discovery of solid operating frames, translating London coding RNAs, etc. And this has happened mainly for human, but also for uh, for uh, other model organisms that I think I did include the slide at the end. And just to finish this section, I also wanted to highlight that uh, new personalization modifications have been detected, again, by reanalyzing uh, raw data with new hypotheses in mind, not taking into account by the original authors. These, there are some examples of publications from a few years ago uh, where they were using fossil rich proteomics data sets, and these are half of some of the modifications that were found. But for instance, there's a very recent example from from a Chinese uh, research group that was published last year in Nature Methods, where they uh, uh, reported the widespread uh, widespread lactylation in the human proteome, and for that they use different target data sets and also they use a spectral labyrinth. Okay, so I'm finalizing, uh, but I thought that it was good to highlight that, of course, uh, there are some <laughs> bottlenecks for uh, data reuse uh, uh, of public proteomics data. The, or for the people that are outside the field, really uh, proteomics data can be quite complex. So that means that there is a steep learning curve for researchers working in other fields, transcriptomics or genomics, for instance. Mass of the raw data is big. And that requires an infrastructure. Then, uh, in many cases, it's a high uh, performance computing infrastructure. And it is a problem that uh, Windows is often a requirement for analysis software in proteins, although this is changing very rapidly. Software analysis methods are, in some cases, very dynamic. So that also adds a difficulty. And of course, another thing that I would like to explain a little bit more in detail is that in many cases, there's a lack of enough metadata annotations in public data, data sets. So there is the need to spend quite some time in curating the, the data sets. And this is because of historical reasons. So uh, when we started Protein Exchange, the main focus was put on uh, providing as, or generalizing, um, generalizing the uh, availability of uh, public data in the field, which was not common uh, in, in the past. So then the focus was put in generating a data set, general description, and then in providing 
the data files. So what we call again, the raw MS instrument files or, or, or the result files containing identification and quantification. So really the, what is missing, what has been missing for, for many years is the mapping between the sample characteristics and, and the data files. So this is what is summarized here. The structured metadata to link individual files to sample characteristics is mostly missing. Very often some information can be inferred, for instance, based on file names, but this is far from ideal, of course. Uh, structured metadata to link to individual samples uh, makes it uh, hard to uh, annotate and reuse the data. So also this would be very important for linking uh, samples in multiomics studies. So in a work that was led by uh, the Seth uh, Pedro from my, from my team, he led the development of a format that is called SDRF proteomics that, um, that is actually a new flavor of a format that already existed in the transcriptomics world that was developed originally by our colleagues in Arrest Press and Expression Atlas in the EBI. And what this format provides is basically that it provides the link between the sample and the data files. We already have the data set general description. This is already available for every protein exchange data set, but the information for linking the samples to the different files and the experimental design is what is provided in this format. It's a tab delimited file and, uh, and uh, we are promoting it uh, as, as much as possible. And its adoption is kind of increasing in, in, in the field. So if you want to know more about the format, there's this GitHub page. And the way to create the files at the moment is uh, mostly manual. So using uh, Excel or any kind of spreadsheet software. But there are now like uh, starting to be tools that can be used to create SDRF proteomics files. So this is the work of Tim Eccles from the uh, Compomics group in Ghent. So he has developed a tool that can, uh, that is the first attempt to generate SDRF proteomics files in a user-friendly manner. This is the URL where you can access uh, that tool. And, and hopefully this and other tools in the future will make uh, SDRF and the annotation of data sets more comprehensive. So um, and just finalizing now, I wanted to highlight that to just to highlight that uh, for you to realize that data in Pride is really reused more and more. In the last 12 months, more than 1.1 petabyte of data have been unloaded by more than uh, 180,000 total unique hosts, and many of them from China. So <laughs> just for just from really China is our most um, uh, kind of. Uh, most popular place in terms of uh, data downloads and, 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 and data reuse, at least from that perspective. And also, Pride datasets have been reused in more than 550 publications. We are tracking this. Of course, this is an underestimation because this only includes the ones that we can really uh, track properly. Our vision for the near future is that data from Pride and other protection resources needs to be integrated more and more in other uh, biological resources. Here we include in resources in the BI like Expression Atlas, Uniprot, PDBE, uh, Data Bank, or Ensemble. Because really, and I think this is important for the field as a whole, uh, proteomics data needs to be more made more accessible to people that are not experts in the field. So people that are not experts in, in proteomics. Good. So just uh, the last part of my talk, just one slide to give you some um, pointers for future, future perspectives. So uh, data sets, in my view, are becoming larger and larger, of course, with uh, larger cohort studies, and maybe single cell proteomics in the future. Uh, so it means that for proteomics resources, there will be the need to have continuous improvements in infrastructure to be able to deal with these larger and larger data sets and to also make some missions feasible for, for you, for the scientists. Then we need to continue enabling improvements in data set metadata provision. Uh, there is also uh, uh, the concept of fair data that I hope you learned if you didn't know about it before. And it's really key for the field to integrate proteomics data in other databases. Uh, there is some kind of new uh, data types that are becoming more and more popular that are not non-MS-based techniques like OLINK and somalogic essays. And we will be able to be able to we will need to store those and make them accessible. And um, yeah, any other topic you would like to raise in the Q&A session, I, will, I, I would be happy to follow. I just have to acknowledge everyone in the team, uh, 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 led by also Jacet Pertural, who is the 
leading many, many activities in my team. And also, I would also look, uh, like to uh, acknowledge the work of uh, my colleagues in other protein exchange resources. And of course, uh, Dicti, especially because he's responsible of, uh, you know, of uh, many of the data submissions that are made to Pride and, uh, and uh, her work is invaluable in this, in this concept. Um, if you want to be the, know a little bit more, there are several publications that you can look at about Pride, Protein Exchange, IPROX, and others. And that's it. I would be happy to take any questions. I think that um, it took, it took me like five minutes more than what I expected, but it always takes a little bit longer, I think. So I'm happy Thank to take you. any questions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Yvonne. It's it's like I I know there are a lot more, and it's very difficult to capture in such a short time frame. <laughs> and but I think the participants and everyone have got at at least a nice overview of what uh, we do, what Pride is, and how um, uh, the importance of public repositories and how and where the data the, has been reused. So uh, just not to take more time here, I would start with the questions. Uh, I, I will keep some questions from the uh, panelists uh, from at the last, but I will ask from the participants first. So the first question is, um, how do we you envision the future of data repository, knowing that data sets nowadays are containing more and more samples, uh, for example, single cell, and some instruments are giving very large raw data. Yeah, so so this is this is what I explained in in my last slide. So this is a continuous struggle for for any proteomics repository in terms of infrastructure. So uh, of course, uh, usually happens. You only realize that things uh, don't work, uh, or you only kind of you know realize that uh, uh, you know pride uh, is there if things don't work in a way because then was when you realize oh this is uh, something is happening there that. Uh, that's usually what happens to us. So it's really, it, it means that in on top of everyday work that we need to do, we really need to be continuously innovating in, 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 the, in terms of uh, infrastructure and in being able to manage uh, increasingly large amounts of data. We are lucky in a way because we are in the EBI, as I mentioned before, and we have the experience that, you know, our colleagues in genomics for instance, have been experiencing for many years. They still deal with, you know, much larger data sets that we are doing. And then for us is, uh, I mean, the first thing to do in many cases is to ask them about, you know, how they manage this or how, how they thought about these problems before, because, uh, because uh, we are lucky from that perspective. Maybe in other places it's not possible, but for us is, 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 is possible to, to do that. But yes, it's a struggle and uh, it is kind of unavoidable. So it's, it's clear that uh, larger and la larger data sets will be made available all the time. And in terms of storage, and this is another aspect, uh, at least at the moment in the ABI, I mean, proteomics is still a tiny fraction when compared to, you know, again, large genomics uh, sequencing projects. So from that perspective, we are kind of, you know, safe. <laughs> but it's true that maybe at some point, uh, you know, the, <laughs> there will be problems because of this. So, um, yeah, so I don't know if I, I could reply. Um, I think hey, but, can, can I have a follow-up question? Yeah. So compared to the genomics data, uh, you know, you have the proteome data deposition increasing over time. You yes. see a very steep increase. But yeah. do you see uh, the same trend for genomics in the past, uh, let's say, 10 to 20 years? Do you how, how do you see the future of proteome? Do you see the future of the proteome data will someday uh, exceed the level of genomics, or you think it's not in the same scale? I mean, so um, there, there are two different points here, to, to announce. So, so in genomics, it's true that there are many, many, many data sets because there are very large sequencing centers in the world that do genomics, so they do it very well and they generate large, large amounts of data. So the profile of submitters to, you know, imagine, for instance, the, the resource of the ABI, the ENA, which is the kind of gem bank for sequencing data in the ABI, or the EGA, which is the kind of uh, control access uh, protected version. So they get uh, in increasing sizes in terms of data sets, but most of that data sets come from, you know, a relatively small number of places. I think what is different, what is different in proteomics is, you know, you have this, or at least at the moment, is that data is generated, you know, by thousands of labs around the world. 
And this is kind of a different uh, kind of a scenario that uh, what ha happens in genomics, at least from my perspective, where most of the data are produced, you know, in a smaller number of centers. So of course the data is larger and larger because the throughput is larger and larger for, for, for genomics. Uh, I think it is difficult to envision, at least as of today, that uh, the amount of proteomics will kind of, you know, be larger <laughs> than in, 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 in genomics, uh, because of course they, I mean, there will always be a lot of things to sequence, organisms or individuals, or <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I think at least at present it's difficult to envision that, you know, that the volume of proteomics data will kind of overtake uh, the sequencing data that's been produced. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to highlight that again there are different different profiles again that uh, what what is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that answers the first questions. And now the second question is availability of sample metadata is crucial for identifying samples, which are important aspects of open data practices. Single large number of data in private uh, pride have metadata missing in them. So what are your suggestions for data submitters to pride? Maybe this could be oh, the takeaway yes, <laughs> take, uh, take away message for the for the people who are uh, who are uh, willing to who are looking forward to submit to the pride. So yeah, please Ivan, go ahead. So as I tried to explain in the last few slides, that again I, I went a little bit faster. So again, proteomics change is really not that not at all. We started from a little more than ten years ago. And at the time, the you know the perception was that the, what we needed to achieve was to to get data availability in the public domain. You know uh, that it would that everyone would be doing this. So um, with that in mind, the opinion from different people that were involved at the time was that uh, the priority should be put in that, and that the priority would be moved to provide more and more data data iteratively. Okay, so so this is what we had in mind when we started this. And it is clear now that uh, in many cases, the lack of metadata is really an impediment for data reuse. So there are different aspects to this um, on one hand. So I'm, not, I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the problems and some of the possible solutions. So in, in, in the last couple of years, again, in the work that was led by Yasset and others in, in EUBIC and, and PSI, there has been the development of this format that can enable uh, the annotation of, of data sets in, in, in this manner. But, uh, you know, this format has to be generated. At the moment, most people generate it manually because the adoption is still relatively low, but I have to say that it's kind of growing. So ideally, in the future, we would have tools, I don't know, like Mask One or Mascot or others in the, in the, in the DIA world that would export this, uh, this information and then in that format, and that format would be available for you to upload into Pride or other resources. But uh, I mean, also historically, the field in many of these tools that are used for analysis, they don't require basically any kind of uh, sample related information when you are performing the analysis. So, so it is kind of a, if a it's a problem that um, that that it will be resolved. But it will be resolved in, you know, in an iterative manner and in kind of a, a slow, a slow manner. Uh, I think in an iterative manner. So what is possible to do right now? If you want to uh, submit to Pride is to create these SDRF files, proteomics files manually. There is this tool that I I introduced at the very end that has been now just uh, developed by um, by Tine that uh, at least for datasets that are uh, not very large. It works well, but of course, this is just the first version. Uh, we need to be made better in, in time for sure, like it happens with any tool. So um, so I think that the future is bright, just to be positive. Uh, as you also saw, uh, we get more than 500 data sets per month. In Pride, we are not so many people and we don't have uh, many resources to, to do this. So this what I want to highlight. This is, this is, not, a, this is not a world that is, you know, for pride only or for massive or for it's a work for the community as a whole and this is a problem that we need to solve all together it is uh, unrealistic to ask you know that one thing solves uh, all this problem just at once because it's, it's really it's really impossible so the situation is much better than what it was two years ago the situation will be better in two years let's, let's put it this way but uh, but i hope that i think that at least now there is a mechanism to do it 
and uh, there are also many data sets that are being annotated a posteriori uh, and the SDRF files are being made available but um, but yes, this is a this is an interactive problem that will be will be solved in time okay yeah so okay so the last question from the uh, participant AR is uh, many journals have dedicated data availability section where yep. acquisition IDs are mentioned have you considered using these to detect publication with pride IDs? So of course we do that. So I, I maybe I didn't explain myself very well. So so we do that. We uh, we check the abstracts of the publications and we check also the full test of publications. But we can only do that if the publication is open access and also if it's fully open access because there are different types of open access and then you can only well. I'm not going to get into the details, but if you have, you know, submitted your publication and the publication is not open access, so you know it's under a, a, a paywall, then it's impossible for us. <laughs> it's impossible for us to know automatically uh, whether you know that the, the data, the data set has been published or not. It's just we don't, we 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 don't have access to that. We can only have access manually one person <laughs> going paper by paper, which is not feasible. I'm sure you understand. So it is not the problem of the data availability statement. That's of course there, and we can look for it. Is that um, that in order to access that, the, the the article needs to be open access, and most articles are not open access. So, or at least a, a majority of them are not open access. So I hope I uh, I could answer the, the question. Yeah, yeah. And there is one question I have answered it, but if you want like to add something on it, is like. Are there any option in Pride to keep raw data private even after publication? These options exist in Massive. So yeah, if you want to add anything to this, I have answered that yes, the, the raw data are public, but if you want to add anything to this. So, I mean, the policy for Proton Exchange is that uh, as soon as the publication is out, the data needs to be made publicly available. So, um, so and, and again, we don't even check this manually. There is a pipeline that is launched, and then it looks, and then you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it is kind of a policy, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be broken unless there is a very good reason for that. Can there be good reasons for it? So for me, this is no justification if you are using data in two different papers and the two of them are not published. So we get this query every once in a while. As soon as one of them is published, then you know why. I don't see why the data shouldn't be made publicly available. And and then there is another reason that is a little bit more, and I didn't get into the details in this talk because it was just too much. Yeah. But there is uh, the issue of uh, data that can be considered to be sensitive for legal reasons. Data coming from human uh, human cohorts and human. Um, for that, in genomics and transcriptomics, there, there is what they are called uh, control access repositories. So we don't have yet that in proteomics. We're actually working on that already. But uh, but in some cases, kind of a proxy, kind of a proxy to to uh, kind of simulate this can be to keep the data private forever. We don't do this in Pride because we cannot do it. But uh, but I know that in, in some colleagues have used this uh, kind of method or method or a kind of a shortcut to try to deal with this situation. But that's uh, kind of a hack, <laughs> let's put it this way. And this is not sustainable in the in the medium long term. In the medium long term, what is sustainable here is to develop a control access infrastructure so that uh, for this sensitive data, so that people will need to. Um, we need to ask for access to this to this data before before they can access it. So I hope I could. Uh, I was clear. Yes. Uh, so there are just two more questions from Tianan, and uh, maybe I, I can I, ask the question. Uh, okay. Since, uh, hey, fine. Since now this is a writing course for people in this field, uh, you mentioned uh, some data more uh, can be reused. You showed some example. Do you have any uh, suggestion on what type of data sets are more frequently reused by others? So uh, what, what should we, what's, what's a good practice for when writing this data set could uh, be potentially okay, so, frequently used? <clears throat> I mean, so the data that, that, that are usually more reused are the ones that are, I mean, there are two, two aspects to this. One of them are the, are the ones that are more scientifically relevant 
So uh, you know the ones that uh, may in some cases get uh, generated by you know a famous group, and they're they are, they are public in high-profile journals. So there are some of the data sets that are get, that, that get more reused. So that's one aspect of that. The other aspect of that, of course, the data sets that get more reused are the ones that are annotated better. So the ones that you know people don't have to really uh, do a lot of work in order to you know again find the relationship between the samples and, and the files. So I think that's those are the two groups of data sets that are reused are reused the most. I mean, in the context of machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's really not, I mean, there are a lot of technical data sets that are reused a lot because they are very useful for the technical objectives of the, you know, of the machine learning kind of methodology. So from, yeah, I mean, so on one hand, yes, it's true that, you know, the, the data sets that, you know, that are kind of become more relevant, get reused more, but actually many, many data sets get, get reused. Uh, and, and some of them are kind of, you know, relatively small technical studies. And it's because of all these possible applications that there are. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. So another question. Uh, any comment to the difference of annotating data files for TMT, BIA, and SM and PRM? The TMT is uh, they have, normally they have several uh, fractions. And uh, those fractions are labeled by um, sometimes six plex, sometimes some uh, sixteen. But DI mostly single shoots, and for SRMPM they also mostly single shoots. Uh, so, do you have any advice? <clears throat> you mean for annotate for an you yeah, for annotation? You annotation of the files, no? Yeah. So, yeah. of course, of course, everything that uh, you know, if there is one sample per MS run. It is uh, it is much easier, and if there is no fractionation. Then there is it is much more easier to to annotate than you know if there are different channels in, for instance, in a TMT experiment. So the SDRF proteomics file format uh, uh, supports all those scenarios, so supports fractionation, supports uh, channels. But um, I wouldn't say that is more easy or more difficult. It's just that it's more. It's more complex because, of course, in a in a TNT uh, MS1, you can have, as, as you say, uh, you know, maybe um, more than a dozen different samples, and they need to be annotated differently, and they all need to be mapped to the corresponding channel and to the corresponding file. That's a little bit more difficult than you know just one sample in one in one MS1. That's what you can get, for instance, from a DIA uh, uh, experiment. At least in most uh, DIA experiments so far, I know that there is now. Starting to be level in there as well. So, um, so, but it's not because it's more difficult conceptually, it's because it's more difficult uh, because there are more samples involved. I don't know if I explain myself correctly there. <clears throat> uh, I can just add, if I may, here that, uh, mm -hmm. Tianan, you can, you can find uh, annotated projects or the samples in our the Pride GitHub page. I can share with you there, and the documentation is all very well explained, and you can always ask project support or you can write to us so you can definitely have a look in our github page for sample annotated data sets or any example files are there to see examples for tmt or dia data sets how they are annotated so you can always you're more than welcome to look there and as i said it's also good again this tool that again is very new so of course it's, it's far for perfect at the moment but the tool that has been developed by Componics, by leonard martinstein and tine in particular, it's also a good attempt, to uh, a good first attempt to try to facilitate this process in a kind of more user-friendly manner than just going through individual uh, Excel files. Mm -hmm. So just now I, I, I noticed you have uh, provided some online tools to reanalyze the data from Pride. Uh, I know from genomics field, uh, so their data are more, the data standards probably more universe. So. Uh, there are a lot of third-party tools to analyze genomic data. But currently for the Pride uh, online tools, uh, they all provided by you. Uh, your, your small team actually did an amazing work, uh, only about 10 people. Uh, but do you open to uh, other third-party collaborators who provide more tools to reanalyze the data? So, I mean, so the, 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 different, the different answers to this. So, so first of all, um, 
all the reanalysis that we do in the team, we we just do it ourselves or with very close collaborators, mainly because of grants, no? So that's kind of similar uh, kind of people that share common interests. So that's kind of different. I think that what you are referring to is that it would be ideal, and I agree, it would be ideal to have again consistent on tools that would be where all the data, what the, all the private data would be available at the moment. You know, especially if you are in China, it's a huge difference. I, I don't even, I cannot even imagine. You need to download the data from yeah. from private, which can take, you know, I don't know, ages. I don't know how, how long <laughs> it take. We were talking about we were talking about this at some point. That's also why it's good to have IPROX in China because, of course, apart from this, because the, the the downloads are make made more manageable. So uh, ideally, it would be ideal to have, you know, the, uh, what is called the concept, the the, the tools uh, closer to the data. That would means that could be like an instance that would contain, I mean, at least some of the high profile private data sets and the tools would be located there. So, you know, external users from China, from, you know, from whatever, you could be able to analyze public data there. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, some kind of cloud uh, enabled infrastructure or something like that. So that would be incredibly nice to have, but um, but uh, but it is not. <laughs> it is difficult to make it feasible. So of course this uh, this is, uh, this costs uh, money, and there have been kind of initial ideas around that. But I think it would be unfeasible in the medium long term unless you know there is kind of uh, a constant uh, or you know a reliable uh, source of funding that you know some projects that we could kind of you know use in, in order to do that because what people don't or maybe do, don't realize is that really computation and all these kind of cloud infrastructure they are really expensive to to maintain especially for huge amounts of data so this would be ideal is a, a very nice vision to have but at the moment at least for proteomics and at least for it's, it's really difficult to materialize because of you know the, the practicabilities of you know or where to where to get the the funding to to get this kind of infrastructure running. So at least from from my perspective. <clears throat> mm, thanks. Okay, so if there are no more questions from anyone, I would like to thank you, uh, Juan Antonio, for his very enlightening talk, and I. I um, I, I I ask all the participants again to look for uh, uh, like our next um, uh, uh, announcement for the uh, ETC auditorium, and I think we can we can finish. And thank you, thank you everyone for attending the today's seminar. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.